So welcome to the Business Reboot Toolkit, a mini series for dental practice owners to give them ideas on how to effectively help their talents to grow their business in this current climate. Now joining us today is our speaker for the series, Dr. Tiv, the one and only. Now, many of you know Dr. Tiv because he wears many hats. So apart from being a very successful multi-million dollar practice dental, well, dental practice owner, he is also running his own successful YouTube channel. Um, his area of expertise is mentoring dental professionals that uh, want to speed up their career progression. When Dr. Tiv graduated from Melbourne Uni on the dental school 17 years ago, he worked in a lot of different places. So he worked in rural settings, he worked in city uh, settings. He also demonstrated at Melbourne University. In fact, he was my demonstrator back and forth. Yeah, don't ask him about what sort of student I was. Um, but anyway, so he was a tutor for myself back then and obviously he did that for about five years. During that time, he also did um, momentum training. So he was a trainer and a um, he gave lectures for the momentum management course. Um, now for the last 10 years, he has been training, coaching and mentoring many dental practice owners and associates, but many of which have gone on to become successful specialists or even practice owners themselves. Now his clinical passion has been in fixed bras, full mouth rehabs, periodontics, which is something that we're like, oh, what are we doing? And patient communication. So I'd love to know more about all that. Now, very early on, Dr. Tiv learned that communication and dental success are learned skills. So he spent a lot of time and effort mastering this, which he now obviously passes on to all the people that he mentors and coaches, and he helps them find their own successes with that as well. So on the side, Dr. Tiv loves sharing his passion for dentistry, photography, videography, dental technology, and also patient communication on his YouTube channel, Dr. Tiv. Um, now, Tiv, it's great to have you on our live today. I already know Thank we're going to have lots of fun. Um, I hope so. Yeah, absolutely. And I know for a fact that, you know, you have a following of um, patients and colleagues that are able to, I suppose, that you're able to motivate people and allow them to, you know, do what they think is the impossible. And I yeah. think that's a really powerful skill to have as a dental practice owner and also as a dentist. Um, and yeah, I know that the audience today will definitely be taking notes. So welcome to the live. It's an Thank absolute pleasure to have you. Beautiful, beautiful. Lovely to be here. Look forward to it. Let's let's talk about dental stuff. Yes, absolutely. I suppose my first question when we jump into mm -hmm. this um, is I'd love to know, I mean, I've seen your practice. I remember when, you know, when um, you first opened up your six chair practice, um, yeah. Um, when you moved across to the new premises, I was probably, I just randomly messaged you and be like, oh, can I come and visit you? Can I come and see your wonderful practice? And yeah, so thank you so much. And you graciously, you know, you know spent the time, took, took me around, my family around um, yeah. and showed us everything. And um, yes, but I think, you know, it'd be great if you can let the audience know how you sort of run your practice, you know, what sort of team do you run? What roles do you, do you have, you know, in terms of people working with you? Sure. So um, as you said, um, you know, when you talk about making the impossible happen, I think of it a bit differently. I think about warping reality. Um, a lot of people have set mindsets on what's possible, and I tend to try and remove those limitations so that things that most people say can't be done, we just do it, and it gets done easily. And so that's kind of how I phrase it. I call it warping reality, where what everyone else thinks is the only way to do it, we kind of don't do it that way. So I might upset some of your viewers by some of the things I say because it's not the norm. Um, mm -hmm. And I've always said, if you do what everyone else does, you kind of have to expect what everyone else gets. Um, and I was actually, yeah, and I was actually really fascinated. I went to a seminar in, um, in Atlanta, um, not that long, well, it was before all of COVID hit, really. It was in January, just before it all happened. Um, and it was a meeting for dentists looking at financial success. And I was flabbergasted by the number of older dental clinicians that were really financially um, poorly set up in, through this time. Yeah. And like, it came to my realization that, that was the norm. The norm was people would work really hard, get to, the, get to the end of their career, sell their practice for not much because I've kind of let it run down. And then they're thinking, wow, what did I do all this time? Um, and we have such potential to earn so much money. It was really just intriguing and interesting to me about what happens. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it was, I guess, 
that's where I look at what we can do differently. And that's what we do, I guess, as well. So I guess a big point of difference is that we run a very lean dental practice. Um, some people call it understaffed. Um, I call it normal. Um, but we run six chairs and we have four assistants, um, one receptionist and three nursing people. They all kind of swap roles, um, but that's generally the way that we, we run it. Um, and the dentists have assistants and the oral health therapists don't. That's basically how it, how it runs. So but these most, therapists, they're not oral health therapists, they're not hygienists you're talking about. No, they're not hygienists, they're oral health therapists. Um, I, I think it's a bit hard to find hygienists these days. Not many, there's not many hygiene courses. Everyone's doing oral health therapy courses. So, um, we find that there's just a, a lot more flexibility in what they can do when they, when they are oral health therapists. Um, we did hire a hygienist uh, many years ago and the inability to work with, um, adult patients to do checkups and exams on them was quite limiting for the way we work. Yeah. Okay. So that's quite interesting. And your oral health therapists, they would obviously see, you know, children do fillings and, and stuff like that as well. But yeah, with so, limited staff, you, you have actually made that work for you. Yeah. So it's it's very hard to to, to describe how we work without really being there. But the, the best analogy I have is that we have, um, I guess, the staff are like water and we have like a vessel and they kind of flow and ebb depending on, on where they need to be. So they're not really stuck in one particular place all the time. They'll actually move depending on where we need them to need them to go. So they'll answer phones if they need to, they'll go and work for OHTs if they need to, they'll assist the dentist if they need to. And it's, it's a very team orientated system because if me as a dentist, if I was very precious about my nurse and said, you can never leave any time ever, then that wouldn't work. But there's times when I don't need the nurse. Like if I'm doing, you know, if I'm setting, um, you know, three sets of crowns and I'm going to spend six minutes doing that, there's no need for that to, for the nurse to sit there. If I'm, you know, waiting for the topical to work, there's no need for the nurse to be sitting there with me. So we just kind of ebb and flow them as we need to, to, to make it work. So that would take a very high level of coordination, wouldn't it? Like they, there's a really clear expectation of when they can leave and when they can come back and, you know, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, pretty much. Um, really clear expectation. Um, but it also um, flows with the day as well. So, you know, the nurse will usually ask for permission from the dentist um, if they can go or not. So if the phone rings, us as clinicians will look at them and nod our head and be like, yep, go if we can let them go. If not, they'll just stick around. So it's not like they will leave whenever they want to. It's still dictated by the clinician, but because we're aware of what it's like when we don't have a, a nurse as well, we're very empathetic to, to the needs of our fellow clinicians. Yeah, excellent. So yeah. like, I know, I know you have a really high performance team culture. Like I witnessed this when I went to visit your practice. I still remember, yeah. um, you know, we, we were there and you know, my my family drag my whole family along. And while we were there, you're showing us around. And I know you weren't actually running the practice at that time. Yeah. And um, basically, you know, the receptionist came in. She turned up, and it wasn't even like she wasn't even told to come in that day. She just decided to come in and help. Um, yeah. You know, where do you? I suppose what I want to find out from you, you know, what are your philosophies when it comes to hiring and training your team members and where do these people come from? How do you find them and how do you get them so motivated? Well, this, this is the big question. This has taken me years to, to try and figure this out. Um, I didn't start my practice this way. In fact, I can tell you all the horror stories that has gone through with any kind of, you know, practice ownership. But currently, you know, when I started, when I thought I wanted to be a practice owner, what I did was I read lots of books and I like thought I, I was a really good assistant, um, sorry, associate dentist. And I thought, you know, I'm just gonna be an owner and the, the staff love me now. And so they're gonna love me when I'm an owner and it's just gonna be the way. And I read all these books, um, you know, there's this book called Who Moved My Cheese, which is to do with change management. And so when I bought the practice, I bought a whole bunch of these books and I sent it all to them beforehand so they can read it. And like also, you know that, you know what though? like. A lot of it's like BS. 
A lot of it doesn't work. A lot of it is like made from these people in theoretical like nonsense land, and it doesn't actually work in the practical world. Um, you know, one example is like giving feedback. Like I read, like you know, when you give feedback, that you should like sandwich it between positive things. If you're going to do, you know, say something bad, you say something nice, and you say something bad, and then you say something nice again. And I was like, that kind of sounded nice in theory, but as you were shaking your head, that's horrible, because you really confuse the staff as to when you're saying nice things and when you're saying bad things. So every time you start saying something nice, they're expecting something bad to come afterwards. And it's just like really like messes the whole thing up. So, so you know, I learned the, the hard way really by making mistakes the, the whole way through. But what I really found worked, and this is something that a lot of owners will say, is that you hire on attitude and behavior, not on skill. So I think the last six or seven hires that we've had, they've had zero dental experience. Um, and I find that really works for us because we're so unlike other dental practices that when we get someone that has previous dental experience, it's like you need to unlearn a lot of bad habits that they already have. And so it's easier for us just to start from scratch and get them to, to up to speed. And usually that takes us about two weeks to get a nurse fairly well up to speed to be able to nurse by themselves to the way we'd like them to, to be. Wow. So we get a weeks. I was yeah. thinking at my practice, we're looking yeah. four weeks to get them up to scratch and then we give them another two weeks buffer. So six weeks is what we do. Wow. Two weeks impressive. I can tell you, warping reality, you, you don't need four weeks. You don't need six weeks. If they're good enough and you pick the right person, it's it, really two weeks. And a lot of it we do by um, figuring out what we need and using that in the, in the interview process. So I'll give you guys some tips. Um, when we bring people in for interviews, I send them, um, we, I use videos because that's my, that's my medium, but I send them a video of, all, of a few of our, our packs that we use and our bear kits, and I get them to memorize all the instruments before they come in for the interview. So I've already done part of the training before they even come in. And if they can't, if mm -hmm. they can't figure that stuff out by interview stage, then they're not even considered. Because I'm like, why am I bothering with someone that can't even be bothered learning you know, these instruments before they come for the interview? This is like honeymoon stage. This is when they're trying to impress me. So I get them to a lot of learning. So they learn that, they learn charting, they learn all sorts of stuff even before they come into the interview. So That's I've done like, <laughs> I've done a week's worth of training, like before they even even come in. Um, the and so we look for attitude, and we need to figure out what kind of attitude we want as well. So we do a bit of disc profiling, which is like a little bit of a personality test to see um, who we need. Um, one of the biggest mistakes I ever made uh, when I when I had when I first learned about personality profiling is I decided, and I and I'm pretty crazy. I decided that if I got everyone exactly the same. I could manage them exactly the same, and I'm going to have an amazing dental practice. And that was the worst thing I could have done. Like we had everyone that was upset about the same things and liked the same things, and no one kind of making up for the inefficiencies of, of other people. So now we do it more like a, I think of it like a, a computer game where you have like different characters that have got different skill sets in different things. And so we look at what we need and we find someone for that particular uh, not really skill, but attitudinal skill. So do we need someone that's more detailed? Do we need someone that's more empathetic? Do we need someone that's more, um, you know, is more outgoing? Do we need someone that's more introverted? And we look for those kinds of facets to build up our team rather than looking for, you know, can this person pick up a phone or can they do, you know, be a reception if they're a nurse, that kind of thing. So they're just some of the things that we do. Um, we set expectations pretty early on, as you see from our, even our interview process, and we make it pretty difficult to join our practice like we do um they have to send a resume you just have to send a video too because we do videos ourselves we want someone that's okay on camera so we kind of test for things through the process and we find that people drop out themselves because of the the hurdles they need to jump then we do a phone interview to make sure they're good on the phones then we get them in for an actual interview where they have to learn these things they come in for a working interview where we do a whole bunch of tests um, to make sure that they've got the right kind of attitude for us. And then only after that, we may consider a second working interview, reference checking, and then hire them. So there's almost nine steps before they even like come on board to our practice. I love that. 
That's right. That's right. It's time. It's time consuming. It's not easy. Yeah, this that's yeah. that's the hard part. It's, something's got to give, and the bit that gives is it's not time. It's it's time consuming. So we need to roughly, and this is gonna this is gonna boggle your mind. We have to go through roughly a hundred applicants to get one that's like the right fit. Yeah, I don't um, I don't doubt that at all. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's hard work, and if you get it wrong, then you start the whole process again. It's it's so interesting that you say that because you know like when you know people talk about high performance team, I think of sports. And, yeah. you know, like we often talk about sports and we're like, yep, the sporting team's amazing, high performance. But you have to think about where do all these people come from? They're like the elite of the elite. They're not just anywhere, are they? You, to yeah. really find these people, they're, well, they're really there. Look, it's not that it's not that it's, they're hard to find. It just needs a lot of sifting to get to them. Yeah. Because a lot of people, you know, you know what it's like in interviews, people can say whatever they want. And for me, I like to test to make sure we're getting the right the right canon, the right fit, rather than just going on their words. So that's why we go through this whole process. And a lot of interviewing questions are, uh, um, what is it called? What's it called when you use examples of previous behavior? Whatever that is. So we always ask, give us an example of a time that you were loyal to your business. And so we try and get examples of, of that kind of thing. So you think that's, is that is that what you t tend to ask? You find that tends to yeah. out of them? I think so. I think of people's behavior a bit like caries incidents. The best indicator of future caries is previous caries. Okay. So what people will do in the future will usually be indicated by what they've done in the past. So if you ask those questions, you will tend to see what they happen. And sometimes people change, they do, but that's up to them and you actually have no control over it. That's fair, yeah. I do find scenario type questions that everyone knows what to say, what are the right things to say in a scenario. But when you're asking them for specific examples of stuff that they've done in the past, then yeah. that's when you're like, oh, yeah, have to think of it. That's right. No, right. That's, and that's also, I, I also ask one other question too. This is a really good question for you guys interviewing. Is I ask them what we'll hate about them when they join us. Okay. So, Instead of the weakness, what will we hate about you? Yeah. Yeah. Because generally they'll pick, because when you say what's your weakness, usually people pick skills. So they'll say, I'm not good at, I don't know, setting up for exos, or they'll say whatever it is. But if you say, what are you going to hate about you? They usually pick an attitudinal issue that you can pick up and see if it's something you can accept or not. So if they say, you know, I get really, when I get upset, I cry. You'd be like, mm, okay, I can deal with that. <laughs> or they might say, you know, when I get upset, I like go in a rage and like start destroying things. And you're like, well, you know, maybe not. I mean, that's that's out there example, but you get the idea. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, uh, some things that come up on interviews will always amaze you. Do you find <laughs> right. I've had some weird ones. Like I think I had this one girl tell me that, you know, one of the times when she ran on her emotions, she basically threw a chair at her classmate and that and she got expelled. And I yeah. thought, okay, yep, yeah, that's come up in the interview. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean it's it's it's, yeah. it's what happens. Yeah. Um, and she's she'll be a fit somewhere, but yes. not not in a dental practice, I guess. Yeah. So going back to you running on minimal staff, I'm always quite intrigued by this. Yes. When, it takes a lot of faith in your team members to do this, I, I feel. Yeah. Because, you know, it means that, you know, I suppose, you know, everyone knows that if someone is down that day, it's going to be, I'm, I'm guessing it's going to be a lot harder. You still get sick leave, right, surely? Because people still get sick naturally. Or do they just come to work and they're sick and you're like, yeah, okay. You know what? They, it's very rare for them to, to not come to work because because we work so into integral with each other that it's like letting the team down. So I actually have physically have to force people not to come to work. I mean, this was, this was pre COVID times. Now COVID times, I think everyone's getting the idea that, you know, when you're sick, you can't come to come to work. Um, but I physically have to be like, go home, like don't be here type thing. Um, and they'd be very apologetic. And the thing that I found was even though, you know, we run a different system to most clinics, even when we're down a person, most of the staff were, we just say, we'll just cope. Okay. And we just run with one more nurse down. 
Um, so the receptionist would be the nurse and then everyone would just help doing reception stuff. So it, 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 it kind of works. So, so maybe I'm, maybe I've got one too many staff members right now, if we can cope well, with one. <laughs> we better be careful. We better be careful. <laughs> well, and look, and this is the conversation that we have with the staff as well. So uh, another thing about how, why they're high performing um, is that, you know, I teach patient communication skills too. And my philosophy is if patients understand what we understand, like actually understand what we understand, then they will want to do what we want to do, right? So if you sent a patient to dental school for five years and got them back and said, you have a, you know, a six millimeter pocket on your one six buckle, they'd be like, all right, let's get that treated. Like that's what they want to do. So the, the thing is for us to give them that level of understanding in a short period of time. I use the same thing with the staff as well. I like to give them the same level of understanding of me as a business owner so that they can make the same decisions that I would make. And that's kind of how it works. So they're really, you know, they're really keen on saving things. Like we haven't lost a triplex tip in like two years or something rather. We haven't, yeah, we haven't lost a rubber dam clamp in, in maybe three or four months. Like we count them and if it's lost, they go through the bins. And sometimes it's a lost leader for me. Like sometimes I'm paying them wages to go and find a rubber dam clamp. But I don't want to, I don't want to dissuade them from that philosophy and passion that they have, yeah. in like making sure that this is my stuff, yeah. and I want to try and find it. And we do like we do some really amazing training um, exercises for them to understand what that means. And that's the trick. The trick is how do we give them that level of understanding without them being owners? And I think that's where that's where you get it from. I don't know where I heard this. Stuff gets around in dental. Yes. I Remember there was some sort of rumour about you and a training session you did with your staff members where you literally threw money out. Yes, that's what I did. In that fact, I think I'm going to do... <laughs> so I, I love these kind of training exercises. It really gives them understanding. And I'm going to do it tomorrow because we've got some new staff members um, and I think they need to, like, understand what, what the rest of the team understands too. And so what I do, uh, and you should do this, and if you if you can't do it, and you've got to uh, practice. Um, I'm happy to come and do it for you. It's 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 such an amazing opening experience that I love. I love doing this stuff. Um, you get two bins. You get some material, and you get the equivalent amount of actual cash. Fake cash doesn't work. You give the cash to the nurses or to the staff members. You throw away the actual bit of whatever it is, and you get them to throw that money into the bin. Okay. And then you throw the next thing. I take a drop of bond. I think there are, it's a drop of bond is like eight bucks a drop or something rather. You take a drop and you put it in, you get them to throw away like five bucks into the bin or whatever it is. You take a soft lace disc and you put it in, they throw 50 cents away. You get, you know, some impression material and they throw that into the bin and they put $50 in. And in the end, you know, you've thrown about, I don't know, $200 or so. And you get them to tie both of them up and put it in the trash. Like actually put it in the trash. Yeah. <laughs> Do you yeah. ever go at night to try and, try and collect the money back? Well, this is the thing. They never want to actually put it in the trash. They're like, we can't, it's money in the bin. And that's when I tell them both bags are exactly the same. The money and all this stuff is exactly the same. So if you feel that way about throwing away actual cash in the bin, then you should feel the same way about the other stuff too. They get mind blown. Like they're like, you can see the understanding in their eyes. And from that day, they are so careful with dispensing materials. They're so careful with throwing things out. They really start getting that, that feeling of, you know, what that actually means, because that's what it means to us as owners. But we don't really, you know, it's different from saying to people, don't throw stuff out or a matrix band is $3. They're like freaking cheapskates, like it's three bucks. Like what's the deal? When they have to throw away two hundred dollars worth of actual cash away, it becomes a big deal. And then I throw it out and I say, if anyone wants to go through the bins, they can go through the bins. And you know what? They go through the bins and they take the money out. And so that's why that's where they don't they're not upset about going through the bins with other stuff because they they see that that's like that's what actually happens. Yeah, so they're that. the kind of yeah they're the kind of tips and tricks that I do to give them that understanding. You can't do it just by telling them. They need to feel what you feel and get that that level of understanding. Love that. So 
what is your plan B usually if mm -hmm. you do have a staff down? If everyone, do. everyone just pushes through. Or have you ever had two yeah. staff literally down, especially now in COVID? It's a yeah, so look, now, now it's getting intriguing. Now I'm not sure what we'll do. Um, so there have been times where I've worked without an S. Um, I've crown prepped without an S before um, with the right chair positioning. It's quite possible. Um, but usually we'll make it work. Yeah. Um, one of the, like, part of, part of this is having the, the humbleness as a clinician not to be too high and mighty. Like, we will put our own accounts through. I will go and nurse for one of the other clinicians if we need to. They will come and nurse for us. We just like, we like each other. We like the environment, the people that we're in. So it's never really a big deal to, like, help each other out. In yeah. fact, we have a lot of fun. We spend way too much time at work. Like, last night we're there until 10.30 at night. We're oh, there wow. until, like, 8 or 9 most nights, and we're usually having a blast and a laugh. And that's part of what we also look for as well, is we look for people that, that aren't time watchers. Because if, I, if you have someone that wants to leave at 5 o'clock sharp and everyone else have, is having a good time, then that doesn't work either. Yeah, that's fair. I think you yeah. need that team mentality, and if everyone's happy to stay together and have have a good time, that's really really important. Yeah, yeah. I mean there there are, there are times we've had temp nurses come in, um, and that's always been a debacle. Like yeah. if you bring a temp nurse into a, a team like ours, it doesn't it doesn't work very well. And usually by the end of the day, the nurses are, are trying to undo all the the stuff that the temp nurse has done, and they're like, why? And you know what you know what they say to me? They're like, stop wasting your money, Doctor Tiv. We'll just do it. I'm like, like that's, that's that's amazing, right? It's amazing that they don't want me to waste my money on getting a temp, and so and so that's kind of what makes my life easier these days. And not that it's easy being a practice owner, but it's easy, you know, easier a little bit. No, that's great. I want to go back in time and just yeah. ask you about what was one of the toughest challenges that you had in team building in the earlier years, and what I suppose what was your golden takeaway from that experience? I've had so many. Um, what mistakes? Look, I was never great at leadership. This is all learnt. Like, all this is learnt, which is what gives me hope for everyone. Because if I can learn it, yeah, then anyone can learn it. And so I've made every mistake under the sun. Like, I've had, like, whole teams of, of people quit within, like, days of each other. I've had... Um, I've had, you know, staff members congregating together, you know, in the car park, you know, making some kind of coup against the practice and things. Um, well, the funniest thing I've ever done, this is before I was even a practice owner, um, I was an associate and I was, I was concerned that they weren't cleaning my room very well. Um, and this just goes down to how bad I was with, with communication to begin with. So being, being a nerdy dental student, a dentist at that point, I decided that I did the white glove test. So I went around to different areas of my room and kind of like um, swept up all the dust. But I didn't even do that. I decided to make a poster about it. <laughs> so I, I labeled the poster as to like where I found the little bits, but I didn't just do that. I went and hung it up in the lunchroom of the, of the practice. <laughs> they didn't talk to me for three months. Oh my goodness. So that's kind of where I start off with. Um, I think one of the big things that I realized early on, the big thing as an owner that I realized early on, this is just another story, is that, like I said, when I was an associate, I was quite well liked. And so for the first time when I was an owner and I walked into the staff room and everyone stopped talking and looked at me, I was just like, okay, shit just got real. And I just, you know, got my lunch and walked back out again. They started talking again. I was like, wow. Like, that's a, yeah, what a huge difference. Huge difference. But look, but coming back to your, your question, the thing that I really, really um, figured out was that your consistency of your behavior is key. So I was really, really, really nice to my staff when I started off, like super nice, like gave them whatever they wanted. And then the one time or the two times I had to say something to them, 
they would like think I was the worst person in the entire world. Okay. And I looked at it and I was like, this is not fair because I know other people are complete a-holes. Yeah. I'm trying to think of a political term, politically correct word for it. Yeah. And their staff are okay and they do one nice thing. And like, they like think it's the best thing in the entire world. And what I came to realize was that whether you're really nice or really mean, if you do it consistently, people are okay. If you're really nice and you just, you're mean just once, you lose your temper just one time, it's like the whole world has changed for these people. You're not what they thought they were. So I had to remember that going forward that, and this was a really big lesson to me, that if I was super nice, I had to be super nice the whole time. But if I wanted them to, to perform well, then I had to stop being the nice guy and be their actual boss and leader because they needed consistency. They needed someone that would be very consistent with what they wanted all the time without wavering. There was never an exception. And when they knew that, they actually lived to those expectations because they knew that that's what I wanted. That's always what I wanted. So that happened very early on. That's a very, very good point there. I think, you know, yeah, that, that's definitely something that I've also personally experienced as well. Um, yeah. yeah, when you when you go up and down, that freaks yeah. people out. That people like that consistency, they want the predictability. Yeah. So, yeah. And yeah. and and connect to that as well. I figure I realized um, that they pick up on our emotions quite well. Because a lot of them that are in this industry are quite empathetic. Yeah. And so I you I know mean, when I was younger. I felt like I had to like make a show of being upset if I was upset with something so they understood that I was upset. But it's like it's like having power steering and like shifting the wheel like the whole way around. Like it's too much. If you just wanted to make a little adjustment, you don't have to do anything. You just have to like just your you know nonverbal cues on what's going on is enough for most people to realize what's going on. And so that's another thing I had to figure out is I didn't have to like, you know make an example of how I felt. I could actually tell people if I wanted to, or they would know. And so that was a really big thing for me as well. Yeah. Boy, we're getting really personal now. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all good. It's very good. So how do you sort of break the chain of, obviously you start off as being super nice. How did you break that chain? Because I'm sure there's lots of owners out there who started off like that. Like I'm definitely in the same boat as you when I, you know, I always thought, and I think that was when my moment of crashing down as a, as a dental practice owner came. Yeah. Because, you know, like, you know, I remember, like, you know, I thought that, you know, people really enjoyed working with me as an associate and all that sort of stuff. Well, I hope so. And yeah. then obviously when I then became an owner, you know, I sort of still had that sort of facade on, or at least, you know, that was still me. But whenever I didn't have to tell someone off, that became like a wall, you know, walls come crumbling down and end yes. of the world, laugh and upset. How yeah. did you turn that around or tweak it? Um, slowly and with pain is the, is the answer. So part of it is becoming more confident with yourself to know that what you want, you can have. So it, this is a, this is a much bigger conversation to have, but really it's about a lot of us as owners become owners because we think it's the next logical step but it's not quite the next logical step. It's actually a different path completely. And a lot of the times what makes us good as an associate makes us terrible as an owner. One is being friendly with the staff and like getting on with them, you know, as buddy buddies, that makes you great as an associate because they love you, they give you stuff, you know, they pay you attention. And so it's great. And if you translate that to being an owner, that's like exactly the opposite of what you should be doing. Um, for me, like, there was there was a point in my and this is why I mean I came from a really low low starting point. I bought this practice. I paid a lot of money for it. The owner had a picture of himself in the surgery I was walk, working in, like a big picture of himself, like in the Himalayas. And I didn't have the courage to tell him that I didn't want a picture of him in my surgery. Like I just couldn't do it. I was like, oh my god, like this is gonna be the end of the world. Like like what's going to happen? So part of, part of, I guess, if you're the, if you're an owner, that's like too nice, you're like, what do I do? 
part of it is realizing that this is your practice and that you can ask for the picture to come down off the wall if you wanted to. And you can ask for the staff to do certain things that's within their job description as well. Because this is what the government is telling you to do. This is what work fair and fair work is telling you to do. They're saying that you have all this power to ask these things. So we're going to put all these restrictions on you. So if you're getting all these restrictions, but you're not using that power, then you're getting the worst of both worlds. And I think that's as owners where we feel trapped. We're like, we can't do anything and we can't ask for anything. So what's the point? You become bitter. You become bitter. But the truth is you actually have the power to ask for a lot of stuff. You just need to figure out how to do the asking that fits in with your personality profiling and, and your style. And so that's what I had to do. I had to figure out that it was okay for me to ask people to do things. And then it was that I had to hold them accountable to it as well. So this is my this is my number one tip for anyone that's doing anything in leadership. It's, it's one rule, and I'm a very simple person, so I only break it down to very simple rules, is the only thing you need to be a good leader is to set expectations and then hold people accountable to it. So you need to tell them what you want, because if they don't know what you want, that's your problem. Like, if they don't know what I want from them, then that's my problem. And then once I know they've understood what I want, and there's a certain way to do that, then it's a matter of holding them accountable to it. So if you tell them what you want, then you forget about it and never look at it again, and that's my problem too. But if they deviate off that, even just a, a tiny bit, you need to be like, hey, you know, hey, Mary, you know how we talked about you doing that? You're doing this. Can you still do that? And she's like, okay. So it's not a big change. It's not you telling them off. You're just course correcting a little bit. And the next time she tries to push the envelope again, you course correct again. And the next time you course correct again. And eventually they just know if they push, you're going to course correct. And that just slowly builds up and builds up and builds up to the point where you can be friendly, but not familiar. And that's a really, that's a really fine distinction. So I'm really friendly with my staff, but I'm not familiar. Yeah. I like so that. I'm, their, I'm not their buddy. Yeah. But I'm friendly. Yeah. I think that's also like almost like a parenting tip sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> Apparently, apparently. I, I feel like they're all my kids sometimes. I yeah. tell you, like, I feel like I'm doing half their parenting for them as well. Yeah. But no, but, but, but it, it is, it's very true. It's one of the other lessons I learned was that I was far too familiar when I started off um, with my staff. I thought we could be best friends and, and you know, be, have a boss, um, you know, staff relationship. And that doesn't, doesn't work very well for a very few few people that are able to distinguish it like clear cut it's possible but most people can't that line is too blurred so you can't do that yeah but don't blur the line basically keep it really cool. don't blur the line look and this this is another myth that i think the books tell you that is not true they say have a flat you know a flat structure you can't you need hierarchy if if the flat structure actually worked you know what major organizations would have it the military would have a flat structure and you know what? They don't. They've got a very, very strong, I think they call it a chain of command. But, you know, there's someone there that goes to that one, to goes to that one, to goes to that one, to goes to that one. And it works. And that's that's kind of what you need to do as well. So we have a very, very, you know, strict culture. And I need reminders of that too sometimes. And that's part of the reason why, you know, they call me Dr. Tiv. Because I know that when they call me Dr. Tiv, that's my, that's my role in that, in that, in that field. Like I'm not Tiv, their best friend. I'm Dr. Tiv. I'm there to do to do my job so they can do their job so that we can, you know, serve our patients. I love that. Yep. Yeah. I agree one hundred percent with the hierarchy. I think it does need to be there. Yeah. yeah. And also it's the fact that a lot yeah. of people will say, you know, you're being an asshole, like why are you doing it? But <laughs> people need people need leadership. They really do. And a lot of people seek it. And if you don't give it to them, uh, you know, they will they will fall apart. And they won't know why. And it's because you didn't give them leadership. So I did want to spend a lot of time, well, not a lot of time, but some time talking about patient communication with you. Did yes. you want to talk a little bit about that? Because I know you're obviously the guru in this area. <laughs> sure. The communication with the team members. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So no. I suppose what I want to know is, you know, what do you feel is the number one thing that people tend to overlook when they're communicating with patients? Oh yeah, 
you know what it is? It's exactly what I said before. It's it's assuming patients understand what we understand when they don't. It's like us lecturing patients or talking about stuff. I have a video that I found um, that's that one of my um, uh, other clinicians sent me saying this would be amazing for one of your communication talks. I was wondering if I could play it. So um, do you want to pop that on? I so this, this is basically, you know, what we, what the patient's perception of what we think we're saying is to them. And I think it was done by Dental Humor. It's, it's pretty funny. Cool. Uh, let me find it. There you go. Okay, your x-rays are all done. The Can you hear that? will be in in just a second. Okay. Okay, how we doing? Hey, I'm good. Okay, well, let's lay you back. Okay. Oh. Oh. Oh, right. Open line for me. Can we the pokey thing? Open. Turn towards me. I have a DOA on 13. What does that mean? Oh, stay open for me. We'll explain it at the end. Exterior deltoid on 15. Vitamin B12 on 10. Syntax error on 8 and 9. And BLT on 5. All the mode? Yeah, let's make it all the mode. Hmm. That's interesting. Tell me if you feel anything when I poke this. Ah! Oh. Yeah, okay. Huh? Blink 182 on 6. PLC on 13. NBA on 3. PYT, R2D2. I'm in this, I'm in this. And the cartridge in the pear tree. Okay, I can't take this anymore. What does all this mean? No. A few cavities, we'll get some fillings done. You can schedule that up with Grace out front, okay? Good seeing you. Oh. Okay, thanks. Don't feel stupid. He doesn't even floss. Beautiful. So, so yeah, so um, that's, that's basically, I guess, the biggest takeaway is that we think that we're communicating well. We think that we are telling things that patients understand. But what we, what we fail to, to really grasp is that we have such a specific knowledge base that what's common sense to us isn't actually common sense to, to anyone else. So, you know, in that video, you know, he was just calling out random numbers and, you know, acronyms and all sorts of things. And it made no sense to us either. But that's basically what the patients are hearing every time we, we talk to them about all this stuff. Even by saying, you know, caries and periodontitis and things like that, it actually makes no, no real sense to them. So the biggest thing about patient communication is that we need to give them that same level of understanding that we have but we need to fast track it without all this extra stuff that's confusing them. And that's, that's probably the biggest takeaway. If you can figure out how to do that, you're gonna be successful. There's no, there's no two ways about it. That's great, yeah. And I guess that sounds simple in concept, but I'm pretty sure to execute that, it's a whole chain of things that you need to learn and sort of be aware of, isn't it? Yeah, it's, um, it, the, the tr the tricky part is doing it in a short amount of time. Yeah. Like how, do you, how do you give them that knowledge in just, you know, in half an hour, 60 minutes, 90 minutes, like whatever time you have with them, how do you get them that level of understanding in that small amount of time? Because, you know, like I said, you know, if you took them to dental school for four years, it'd be fine, but we can't do that for every single patient. So that's the hard part. How do we figure out what information to give them in what certain way to that certain person to make it so they understand what's going on in their mouth to the way that they understand it. A bit like what I do with the staff, where I use throwing away money to make them understand what, what it meant to, to throw away, you know, equipment and to, to waste product. Like, how can we do that with patients? There's definitely ways to do it. Like I said, you know, I came from a practice where we saw, I think, like 30, 40 patients a day. And, um, you know, it was like very quick kind of work. And I was told, you know, not to talk about indirect work unless you've seen the patient for three years. Like oh. you got to build up that you got to build up that that rapport with them. If you don't do that, you can't talk about it. Um, mm -hmm. To now, where you know, I'm presenting like big plans to people in day one, and they're like, yeah, you know what, I want it, that kind of thing. So, so you know, there, there's a lot to go in there, and it didn't happen overnight for me. 
Um, but, you know, the good news is that a lot of us um, have done all the, the hard yards and got rid of the crappy stuff. So the stuff you can get now is pretty good. So mm -hmm. you can do communication courses and stuff and, and, you know, get that ability pretty quickly. That's great. So how about in terms of communication with your team members then? Mm -hmm. What about it? Um, like, I suppose what I want to find out from you is, um, you know, any, any tips if you had to say, okay, what's the number one thing that biggest oh, mistakes? Okay. So well, number one tips of communicating with team members. Um, number one tip. Oh, let me have a look. That's a hard one. Number one. Um, there's a lot of tips. Constant communication is is quite imperative um i hate team meetings okay. because team meetings usually have the connotation that people are going to talk about something and you're going to argue and you're going to like everyone's going to put forth their their two cents and all the rest and you end up doing nothing at all and you go away having no change but i love um team training so we have team training once a week, but we don't really have many meetings. Okay, yeah. Um, so in those team trainings, I will get people's opinions because I think it's important to get their opinions. So I will ask the opinion of all my staff from other dentists to oral health therapists to my nurse to receptionists to give me feedback on things or to give me their idea on what's going on. Everyone wants to be heard. And I think that's the big thing is that a lot of our staff members feel like they're not being heard or not being valued. Mm -hmm. And if you actually spend the time to ask them what their opinions are, they'll have a lot of really intelligent, you know, opinions about things or things they see you do that you're not aware of, even in your communication style that they'll give you feedback on. Mm -hmm. Now, the important thing is you don't have to take on board everything they say, and they don't really want you to take on board everything they say. They don't want you to implement everything they say but they want to know that they've been listened to. Yeah. Want to be heard. So in terms of staff, they just want to be heard. And so that's kind of what happens with us. So everyone really gets heard. And if they have any issues or concerns or ideas, they'll come to me and I'll be like, great idea. Like, tell me about it. I'll get them to do some homework on it and they'll come back. But they know that I may or may not go ahead with it. And I'll have reasons and I'll explain my reasons, you know, why we do or don't. And they're okay with it because they've been heard, they've had reasons why we can and can't do it, and they're happy to fall under my lead afterwards, but at least they've been heard. Yeah. And I think that's a really important thing. And even if you're an associate, like you don't have to be an owner for this. Like if you're an associate and you're working with staff members, they just wanna know that you respect them. So I make a, I make a big point of introducing my nurse um, when I walk into the room. You know, I'll say something like, this is the, the lovely Isla, she'll be helping me out today, something of, of that line. And I almost, categorically the patient will thank them before they leave because I've made the introduction beforehand. And so that just gives them that little bit of extra respect that you appreciate what they do and they appreciate that you appreciate what they do. So it kind of gets that communication thing happening as well. That's right. That's really, really good. And I, don't know, I don't know if that was number one, but that was one thing. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, um, all right. I know you're a very creative person, so I'm, I, just, I was wondering if you mind sharing two things um, that you do with your practice that's just a bit unique or different or out there. I, I, I do already know one. So, for example, I do know that your team communicates via the, what do you call the it? Radius. Yeah. Radios. Yeah. So we, we have um, two-way, you can call them walkie-talkies, I guess, but two-way radios. So we're all kind of wired up. Um, it's funny, a lot of patients think we're all hearing impaired because we wear these <laughs> little, little radio things. Um, but it means that we can communicate to each other. So remember I was talking about how we can ebb and flow and get things done. The reason we can do that is because we can communicate instantaneously with each other as to who needs what and where. So even if my nest leaves me, I can get them back at a click of a button because I can just say, you know, Emma, come back and she'll come back. So that's probably one thing. Um, the second thing that's unique is... Ooh. What is it that you want to know exactly? Like, what's the, like, what what we do that's 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 really different? Yeah, yeah, like you drop the money. 
Yeah. Uh, um, the other thing that I've done. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, it's probably normal to me. That's that's the thing. So the other thing, uh, yeah, um, I'm thinking what's like really different, special to me. Um, the other thing that I did in terms of getting them to understand was I made them practice owner for of the practice for about half an hour. So they get to make decisions about what's going on. Um, I made like a pretend practice where they got to employ staff and, and so forth. And I had to do it because there was some miscommunication about how JobKeeper worked and what that actually meant. Um, and yeah, and so, and so look, it's not, it's not always peaches and roses, you know, for me or anyone, there's always, you know, ups and downs of how it works. So when that happens, I need to figure out a way of how to get them to understand what was happening to me. So I thought the best way to do it was to get them to be in charge of their own dental practice. So, you know, we had it, I brought in toy figurines, they got to hire people, when things got tough, they had to make the tough decisions, which meant they started firing people. And so we figured out why, who do they find? Why do they fire them first? And they fire the people that weren't valuable. And that was a big, you know, light bulb moment for them. They're like, oh crap, I better be valuable. Or, you know, I might be the first one to go. And so, you know, th that I think that was a really good kind of training exercise that we did to, to help them get a bit more understanding of what's going on. In terms of other differences we do at the practice, um, oh, here's a good one. No one's gonna like me for this. Um, but as dentists, we do steri and mop the floors and do accounts as well. Um, so there's, we, if we need to help out, we just help out. Um, and again, that just helps with the flow. Sorry, say it again? you would do it would your associates do it so today i mop the floor yes uh, oh yeah oh uh, yeah so would your also do it yeah they do it more than i do i must they say know. um That's yeah cool. dr j the other day he was he had the mop out it was funny because we had a new trainee and um the trainee was watching him and he was mopping and i walked into the room and i'm like something's odd here <laughs> like, why are you mopping the floor and the trainee's standing around but he was showing uh, like how we like the room mopped or something or other um, and you know what? It shows it shows um, to your staff that you're not above them, that you're that you even though there's hierarchy, and this is a really odd concept people understand. Even though there's a hierarchy that's needed for leadership, you don't think you're better than them. The hierarchy is just there to make the system work, but that doesn't mean that you're any better than them. Look, even though I say that, when I pick up a mop to try and mop the floor, like six of like. Everyone comes up to me like, what the hell are you doing? Give it to us. You've got better things to do with your time. And I think part of that's also because I make sure that when I'm at work, I'm there to work. I don't think they've ever seen me like on my phone lazing around or, you know, watching TV or doing anything like that. So they don't think that I'm resting while they're working. You know, there's, there's, a, there's, a, good, there's a good quote from some movie that says, you know, we already take enough from them. Don't take any more. So, you know, you want to make sure, and, and we've, we're paying them, so I know we're not taking, but, you know, we feel like we're getting stuff from them. So by doing that and by asking more of them, by saying, well, you work, well, I'm just going to sit back and relax, there's always going to be a little bit of animosity there. Yeah. So because we don't show that, we find that the clinicians that work the hardest to help them are usually the ones with the books that get booked up the most. Yes. It's funny that. Mm -hmm. It's very funny that. Yeah, I love that. Thank you so much for your time today. It's been a pleasure. I hope that's been useful. Um, yeah. I just talk and do what I do, but you're welcome to come down, have a look again. So it's good. Yeah, I'll come and visit you again. <laughs> when the lockdown is over, I'll just announce yeah, I know. when the lockdown is over. But I yeah. know, right? It's it's a crazy world we live in. But but anyway, I, I hope your audience appreciates, you know, is uh, find something useful in what we said. And and as you know, I do the mentoring thing. And if you want to follow me on my YouTube channel, it's down here on the on the thing there somewhere. Um, yeah. You can subscribe, and I've got a website now, drtiv.com. So you can check that out if you want to get in contact with me. There's actually a lot of really good stuff on your YouTube. My practice actually rolls their board the way you do. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. 
your YouTube. Well, it's, it's funny when you when you uh, when you Google how to how to make gauze pack or something rather, we're like number one. We've somehow become the gauze packing you know tutorial of the world. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Excellent. Right, well, thank you so much for your time tonight. And um, thank you, Abby Feet. We'll see you around. Any last words before I let you go? Uh, not really. Um, look, I'm happy to help people out. So if you ever need a helping hand, I'm on Facebook. Um, it's the Vaganir Malin, my full name, or um, Instagram is Doctor Tiv. Um, or YouTube, just just shout out, and I'm happy to happy to answer questions and and talk to people about stuff. I love dentistry. I love talking to people. Um, and my philosophy is, you know, why do why do all the hard work again? You know, some of us have already invented the wheel, so yeah. take our wheel and make it into a race car. Like, don't have to reinvent the wheel again. I love that. Turn it into a race car. Turn it into a race car. Thank you. Have a lovely cool. night. Thank you, Becky.